Uh, so today we're going to uh, talk a little bit about, um, about him, about his love. You got your Bibles, turn into uh, turn to uh, John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Knowing that when you do that, it's the end for you. 
And that's some pretty, pretty great love, isn't it? Uh, we're we're going to talk about this great love. How do we, how do we get that great love? What's it, what's it all about? Uh, what I find interesting about uh, the word love, loved, uh, loving, or, or lover, or lovers, is it's mentioned in the Bible 442 times in 384 verses. Those words are used. Now, that's telling me there's, there's some pretty substantial issues with the word love, love, lovers, love, loves, and, and loved, and all that. So, But what I find interesting, when you look at the first mention of that word in the Bible, and you look at the last mention of that word in the Bible, you find two very different meanings of what that word is. The first mention is mentioned in uh, Genesis chapter 24, 67, if you want to turn there. 24, 67, in the book of Genesis. says in verse 67, and Isaac brought her into his mother, Sarah's tent, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now, if you look over in a, a verse of, uh, 11 of Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, Talking about greater love here. Revelation chapter 12. Verse 10 and 11. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast out. And that will be a good day. When we see that dragon cast down, when we see the devil in all his wicked, evil ways, thrown down, cast down, the Bible says he's going to be judged like a man. They look at him and they say, is this the man that deceiveth all nations? And one day, he's going to be cast down. I tell you what, that makes me want to shout. Because I know one day the enemy's going to be abolished. I know one day I'm not going to have an adversary anymore. He's going to be gone. He's going to be under the power of God for judgment, and he will be judged. Guaranteed, the Bible says it. And then it says, the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. He don't stop. He won't stop until that day. He's going to accuse you. He's going to accuse your loved ones. He's going to accuse your church. He's going to accuse your preacher. He's going to accuse your husband. He's going to accuse your wife, your children. Everybody and everything that you know, he brings accusation against. But he's going to be abolished. Thank God for that. And then in verse 11 it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Two very different meanings of the word love there. And if you want greater love, you've got to have a broad range of what that means and what it takes from you to have that kind of love. The first mention of it, over there talking about Isaac, guess what love did for him? It comforted him. It says that he was comforted after his mother's death, the Bible says. So that means love, greater love, the kind of love that God wants us to have is a comforting love. It ought not be a love of stress. It ought not be a love of trial. It ought to be a comforting love. As a husband and a wife, when you guys are, are, are maybe not in sorts and maybe not uh, getting along quite so well, now don't look at me cross-eyed. I'm married too. I love my wife and she loves me, but we're not always on the same page. We don't always get along like you see us when we're happy with each other and all goofy eye towards each other. We're not like that all the time. Sometimes we have our disagreements. I'm a different kind of man, and she's a different kind of woman, and sometimes those differences, they're a struggle to get through. But the one thing I know is that no matter how bad a disagreement we have, when I look at my finger and I see that wedding band on my hand, here's what I know. She made a promise to love me. Amen. And that's comforting to me, to know that. That my wife loves me, no matter what. 
my wife loves me. And I hope and I pray that she can say the same thing on the other side of the fence about me. That she can look at her hand and see that wedding band. That's my wedding band, by the way. And this is her wedding band. It's a reminder of the faithful vow that she gave me at that altar. And it's a reminder of the covenant that we made with God. And that reminds me that she said she will always be faithful to me. That's what that ring is a promise of. And that's comforting to me no matter how bad things get. Because I know that it's going to end. I know one day that disagreement isn't going to matter anymore, and it will be abolished. It will be gone. God will take care of that thing. But now over in Revelation chapter 11, this is a different kind of love, isn't it? This is a love of denial. This is saying they love not their lives unto the death. You know what that means? They care more about the cause than they did about their own lives. That's love. When you're willing to put your life on the line for something that you stand on. And there are some things as Christians that we ought to be willing to put our life on the line for, to stand on. And I truly believe this. Our very first thing that we need to stand on is the authority of this Bible. The authority of that King James Bible. If you've not got a standard of truth, an absolute truth, you're going to be wishy-washy as a Christian. Yeah, you're going to heaven. Yeah, you're saved. And yeah, you love the Lord. But guess what? That's not abiding in His love. That's just loving Him. They show two very different aspects of the word love. The first one is comforting. The second one is the kind of love that will call you to deny yourself. So let's get into this. Pray that God will open up our hearts, uh, our mind, and our soul to what greater love actually is. We're going to go to the Bible for it. We're going to go right to the text that we read back in John chapter 15. We're going to look at these a little verse at a time. Fun way of studying the Word of God. Fun way of understanding the Word of God. Fun way of figuring out what God means when He says certain words. First thing I want to talk about, if you want greater love, you have to realize it's a shared love. You didn't gain it on yourself. It didn't come because of something you are. Look at verse 1, the verse 9 of, of John chapter 15, the first, uh, first verse of our text. It says, As the Father loved me, so have I loved you. <clears throat> Continue ye in my love. He said three things in this short little verse about love. Number one, he said the Father loved him. That means God, in all his knowledge, and all his, everything about him, and all those wonderful attributes that he has, loved his son. He loved him. That tells me something about the sacrifice on the cross. You know what that tells me? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That tells me that God loved us. He loved the idea of being reconciled back to his creation more than he loved his son. But the Bible tells him, the Bible says, and Jesus says this to his followers, he said, as the Father hath loved me. That means God was willing to give something up to have that love shared with us. The second thing it shows is because of that, we're able to love others like Christ loved us. Isn't that what we're supposed to do anyway? Are we supposed to love others like Christ loved us? That means I ought to love God's people like Christ loved me. That means you ought to love God's people like Christ loved you. So what he says is, the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. He's sharing his love. The love that the Father showed him, he's showing to us. And you know, when you look at society today, and you look at households, and you look at divorce rates, and you look at, I was talking this about the, uh, the other day to a guy, Ohio's divorce rates are 4.9. The average in, in America is 2.9. Now that's not how many marriages end up in divorce. They base that on population. That means out of a thousand people, the most marriages there can be is 500. The average home in America is five people. That means the most marriages there can be is 200. That means if every couple's married. That means if everybody's married, they base it on the population count. 4.9% in Ohio comes out to 57.3% of marriages end in divorce. 
Marriages, they're falling out of great love, aren't they? They're falling out of it. And because of that, we've got a society, we've got children that don't know what love is. They are divided homes. They're, and by the way, the divorce rate isn't much lower in church. Why? Because most people aren't faithful to church. But now when you take people that are faithful to church, that are there three or three times a week, that are there on Sunday, Sunday evenings, Wednesday nights, that are actually involved in the church, those divorce rates go way down. That's telling me that people that are doing what God wants them to do will abide in His love. And that abiding in His love will keep their families together. You say, oh, that's just too simple. It is. We make it difficult, though, don't we? You want a marriage to work? Be faithful to church and God. You want your children to be raised up right? Raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. You want them to grow spiritually? Encourage them to do spiritual things. Pray with them. Read the Bible with them. Tell them how good God is. Show them how much God loves them by, you, by them loving you because of the love that God gave to you. And then he says this. Continue ye in my love. <clears throat> so keep doing it. Walk in. That means because of the love of God to Christ and the love of Christ that he showed me, that means I can share that love with other people. The only way I can have greater love is to love others like God loved Jesus and like Jesus loved me. That is the only way to experience that greater love. I now love because Christ shared his love with me. And because of that sharing, I'd be selfish if I didn't share it with others. You know, the worst, worst doctor in the world would be a doctor that had the cure of cancer but never shared it with nobody, huh? For this reason or the other. And you know, there's men like that and women like that. There's doctors like that that do exist. Don't be a Christian like that. Share something better than the cure for cancer. Share with them the love of Christ. Let them know how much God loved them. That he loved you more than he loved his own son. Because his own son, he sent to the cross. And God loves Jesus pretty much. It's uncomparable. I can't even think of how much God loved Jesus Christ. But he loved him enough to put him on that cross because he loved me too. And we need to think about that. The sacrifice that was given so that we could be reconciled to God. Now isn't that comforting? You say, what's that got to do with comfort? This, here's what it has to do with comfort. God shares his love with us. It's a shared love. And for me, that's pretty comforting. It's comforting knowing he's coming back for me someday. But I'll tell you what else is comforting. Knowing that no matter what I do, no matter where I'm at, and what I say, my God loves me. He absolutely loves me. Me. I think this verse gives comfort because it's showing how he shared his love with us. The second thing about greater love, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even, even, abide, even, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Greater love is rewarded. You share greater love, guess what? You get something in return. The word abide in this verse means to rest or dwell. That means it's an abode, it's a place. It's somewhere we go. But there's a stipulation to that, isn't there? There's a stipulation to abiding. In his love. Sure, we can love others, but are we abiding in the love of Christ? Are we in that place? Are we in that little protective shell of love that God's given us? That little little dwelling place, that little refuge. My God, my strength, the Bible says I'll find I will find refuge in him. That's where I'm going to have refuge, is in that, that love that he's got, that place of love that I can abide in. But how do you abide in that love? It's not something you just get. It's not. There's, there's things in the Bible that God just flat out promises us because he loves us. 
But there's other things that we only get if we do certain things. And the one thing we only get is a place of peace. A place where we can abide in His love. Not abide in love. He said, abide in my love. But right before that, right before that, there's a little comment. And then there's these words. If ye keep my commandments. We're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about abiding in God's love. This has nothing to do with how a man gets saved or how a man's kept saved. This has to do with having a place of peace, having a place of rest, having a place to dwell. Say, what does it cost me? I have to keep his commandments. You know, I bet if I pick five people out in this room and ask them to recite the Ten Commandments without your Bible, without your cell phone, without a cheat sheet, most of my friends are going to recite them. It's all ten of them. You know how many commandments there are in the Bible? There's a lot more than ten. Read the book of Leviticus. There's all kinds of them. You say, that's to the Jews. Aren't they examples of us? Doesn't God have rules for us too in this new, new age we live in? Doesn't God have rules in this, this dispensation of grace that we're in? We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about abiding in His love. He said, if you keep my commandments. We want the full explanation of what love is, right? But we're talking about greater love. We're talking about a love that's beyond us, that only God can give. And that love is God. That love, after you are saved, is gotten by abiding in, or by keeping His commandments. And you say, well, what are the commandments? There's only two that we've got to worry about. The Bible says the whole law hinges on those two commandments. You say, what are they? Love your neighbor as yourself. And give. Love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul. Those are the two things you've got to do. If you love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul, guess what? You'll keep His commandments. You know why we break them? Because at that moment... At that very moment, we're not abiding. At that very moment, we're not thinking about what's good. At that very moment, we're not thinking about keeping His commandments. We're not thinking about someone else because we're not denying ourselves. We're not giving ourselves. We're not giving our time. We're not giving our money. We're not giving our talents. We're not giving everything that God has given us. We are not sharing it with other people. We need to share it. And when we're able to share, we're willing to share, at that point, guess what? We're not going to be worried about ourselves. We're going to be worried about other people in Christ. And we will keep those commandments. Love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul. And do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Pretty simple, isn't it? When you break a commandment, or you do something that's wrong, it's because those two commandments you just ignored. You say, well, what's that mean? That means... If there's something put in front of me I know I shouldn't be doing, I need to deny myself. I need to deny those, those fleshly desires that I might have. I need to deny that pride that might be run through or that stubbornness. I need to deny those things and let God show me where I am, show me how to abide in that love. You do it by keeping His word, keeping His commandments. In order to abide in His love, we have to do some things. It's just not something we get automatically. It's the kind of love that we can only get through obedience to God. And the only way we can do that is to not deny ourselves. Remember what it said over there in Revelation chapter 12? It's a denying love. They went to the chopping block. They said, we love our God enough where we'll die for him. And as you read down in the text, if you look at verse 12, God tells you exactly what we're to do anyway. He says, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Remember, first point, it's a shared love. All he's ordering us to do is to love others, to share it with them. If you're in here today, and you went long without telling somebody about the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary, and the love that he showed them to die on the cross for him, you're not sharing that love. You're not. 
You say, well, I, I can't do this. Yeah, you can. If you've got the love of God in you, and you're denying yourself, you'll be able to tell somebody else about the Lord. If you can't do it verbally, here's what you do. You know what I just did? I didn't open my mouth. Brian, what did I give you? Track. What's in that track, Brian? Verses. What are those verses talking about, Brian? Salvation. Salvation. It's talking about the love of God on Calvary. It's talking about the sacrifice, the denying of himself. You say, well, I can't talk to people. I can't this or that. Well, you know what? Drop it off on their table at the restaurant as you walk by. Start doing that. You'll start experiencing something you've never experienced before. You'll lay home at night and that Holy Spirit will start dealing with your heart and saying, you know, you gave somebody the gospel today. You share that love that I showed you on Calvary with somebody else. And guess what that will do? That will cause you to abide in his love. Anybody can hand out a gospel tract. Shy people. My problem is I hand out too many of them. I run out. <laughs> I can't carry all of them. But hand a gospel tract out. You're looking at a preacher that got saved because some man gave me a gospel. And that thing pricked my heart for two days. And then I accepted Jesus Christ as my son. Because a man who shared the love of God with me. <laughs> he humbled himself, came down with life. <coughs> Jesus did. He lived a sinless and yielding life. He was obedient to his Father's will. We're talking about a denial of ourselves turned to. Um, if you want to, I'm just going to read the verses. Don't have to turn there for sake of time. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews uh, chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. Okay. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 10, it, 5, verse, uh, 5 through 10, it says this. So also Christ glorified not himself. Boy, that's something right there. Glorified not himself. To be made a high priest. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, the dead today have I begotten thee. This is God talking to him as he said also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of the Melch Melchizedek. And what that is, real quick Bible study here, there is no recorded beginning of the order of the Melchizedek. There's some that say that was who taught Adam how to give or how to enable how to give their sacrifices. There are some that say that that's who taught Moses on the mountain was an order of the Melchizedek. And it's an order of priesthood that has no recorded beginning and no recorded ending. And then it says this, who in the days... In, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears, this is Jesus Christ, unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard, was, was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, the Bible says, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Call it in verse 10 of God on high priest after the order of the Melchizedek. When we experience and share our time, our resources, our talents, and more importantly than all that, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is then that we will find ourselves dwelling in that place of rest that it talks about when you're abiding. Greater love is a shared love. It's a rewarding love. And the last point is a filling love. Look at John chapter 15, verse 11. These things have I written, or have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might <coughs> remain. Is there anybody in here that can name all the promises of God? I can't. 
But those promises are broken down into two different types of promises. Some of them are just promises. We get, we do nothing. Others of them are contingent on something that we must do. Uh, you say, what God promised us eternal life, right? He promised the world eternal life, didn't he? Does that mean everybody's got it? No. That promise, attaining that, is contingent on what thing you need of Christ. What about his death, his burial, and his resurrection? What about bowing down, confessing with your mouth, and believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead? Our eternal salvation is based on that. We don't just get it. We have to bow down and humble ourselves, swallow our pride, and say, Lord, I want you to save me. I believe you died on that cross for my sin. I know I'm a sinner, and I deserve that. But you died in my place. Lord, I accept your payment for my sin. That's salvation right there. If there was any doubt of me being saved, I just said the sinner's prayer, so I'm saved again. So, <laughs> you can't lose it. It's a done deal. So some promises are contingent on what we do, like I said. Now, we're given one of those promises that aren't contingent. Turn over to Galatians chapter 5. It's a filling love. It's a filling love. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22. We're given, we're given joy at the moment of salvation. At the very moment we, be, we bow down and that spiritual operation comes, the Word of God is quick and uh, powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword dividing it and thunder and all that. When that happens, we are immediately saved. Boom, it's done. We are now, once again, reconciled to God. To a holy God. And that's what Galatians 5 is. That's what it's talking about, is what you get at that moment. The Bible says, but the fruit, notice it's not plural, it's single, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Catch that? Joy. Joy. Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. The joy that Galatians speaks of is the kind of joy that you get immediately in salvation. This is the kind of joy that sets in and you have no reason why it happened. You can't explain it. When a loved one dies, that joy in your heart knowing you'll see him again. That's a fruit. That's a fruit of the Spirit. When you mess up, when you do something against your God or you hurt somebody, that joy that you have in your heart knowing that God still sees you as his son. And as his daughter. That's that kind of joy in Galatians. The kind of joy when everything around you is falling apart. But deep down in your soul, deep down in your heart, you still have a little joy. That's the kind of joy in Galatians. But the kind of joy over here in John is a different kind. Of joy. This is the kind of joy that just makes you want to get up and shout. This is the kind of joy that you get by you get excited about knowing. Knowing that you're doing right by God. You know, there's this term that we use many times in Christian circles. It's called backsliding. And the interesting thing about backsliding is it's not something that just happens. It's a process. It's a long process sometimes. It can go on. Your, your backsliding can go on for months and get worse and worse and worse and worse. So gradually and so slow that you don't even realize that you have become backslidden. You say, how do, I, how do I know that? Well, what were you doing for Jesus Christ five years ago compared to today? Were you faithful to church five years ago today? Or five years ago, but today you're not? Were you handing out gospel tracts ten years ago, but today you, you, you don't? Were you, were you reading your Bible on a regular basis five years ago, but today you don't? Were you praying on a regular basis like two weeks ago, but today you're not? When you start comparing it like that, you start realizing how far away you slid for God. And you lose that joy that you had when you were serving Him with your whole heart, mind, and soul. And you say, well, what do I do when that happens? Accept the rebuke from God and revive yourself. This joy in 
John is the kind of joy that causes your cup to run over. It's the kind of joy that you cannot contain. It's the kind of joy that when you think about your God and how much He loves you, it makes you want to jump through and holler in your soul. Do you have that kind of joy today? Greater love fills you up. Greater love is a shared love, it's a rewarding love, and it's a love that fills your soul. It's the only one that can. And I can tell you this, when I'm in direct obedience to my God, it brings a joy that I cannot find in any place or in anyone. I can only find it when I'm in obedience to Him. Christ experienced that same kind of joy when He endured the cross. Remember I said, I said greater love is a sacrificial, it's a denial of self. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. The Bible says this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It says, who for the joy that was set before him. You know what that tells me? As Christ is carrying his cross, he's got that thing on his shoulder, and he's walking down those streets and up that mountain at a place called the Skull. And he's walking up Mount Go he's walking up Golgotha, sweating, bleeding, beaten, crown of thorns on his head. Every ounce of, uh, of energy he had is gone, dragging that cross. Now I've seen a guy back home, um, and what he'll do is he'll take the cross and he'll walk all the way through town and have wheels on the back of that cross where he's carrying it like this, but there's wheels on it. And watching him do that, he gets wore out after about an hour of doing that. Jesus didn't even have wheels on that cross. It was about ten times heavier than the cross that he said the other guy was carrying. And, and I'm telling you, he did it with joy. You know why? He knew that by denying himself, he could reconcile a sinful people back to a loving God so that they could spread the good news of salvation to all he had joy because he saw what the result was. If we start seeing the result of giving ourselves to others, we'll do it a little bit more. We'll deny ourselves a little bit more. Because nothing, nothing is better than watching a husband and wife reconcile. Nothing is better than watching a father and a son's relationship get fixed. Nothing is better than when you give your time and you invest your time into some family somewhere and you help them, seeing the smiles on that family the next time they see it puts joy in your heart that only God can give. Because of something that you did, you denied yourself. A lost and a separated people get an opportunity to be reconciled to a holy God. And Jesus was the epitome of what greater love is. And he proved it to the whole world by shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary for a people that did not deserve it. For a people that he knew in the future would still reject him. For a people that he knew even after they accepted him would stop loving him. As Mary comes to the piano and The Bible says in John chapter 15, verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus shared the love of God. And he laid down his life. <coughs> us on Calvary to show us what greater love is. A man that laid down his life for his friends. We all come to our feet and bow to us.
Spirit dealt with your heart today about heaven and hell. You know, those two places exist. God shared his love on Calvary so that you didn't have to go to hell. He shared his love on Calvary, gave of himself, gave of everything, just for the opportunity for you to accept him as your Savior. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, all the sin of God. That means every one of us in this room is going to sin without Jesus Christ. It means we're sinners. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We're going to die because of that sin. That's our payment, is death. We take our last breath. And the Bible says over in Hebrews, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That means we're going to be judged one day after we take our last breath. But you know what's neat about that? Is God gives you a chance to let that judgment fall on the cross of Calvary on the body of Jesus Christ. He said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's greater love. That's sacrificial love. That's a love of denying himself. And that's a love that he has shared with the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed on him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. Isn't that good enough? You know what? The Bible says that you don't condemn you. You condemn yourself by not believing on the record that God gave His only begotten Son. Are you in here today? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt where you're going to spend eternity? If I can just get a show of hands, anybody here that knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're going to heaven when they take their last breath, they may have hands all over the room. All over the room. It's good to be amongst the brethren, amongst the body of believers. How about you that didn't raise your hand? You can get that thing taken care of today. God wants to share His love with you. He's denied himself so that you can come up to this altar today and ask him to save your soul. Is there anybody out there that's bound by still close? Anybody out there today that can say, you know what, preacher? I need to be saved. I need to be saved today. I know that if I die tonight, I'm not going to heaven. Just by a show of hands, anybody at all? Anybody at all? Okay, heads bowed, eyes still closed. How about you, Christian? Have you shared God's love with others? You say, well, you know what? I haven't, but I want to. That's the first step. The second step is this. Just do it. How many people here today say, you know what, preacher? I, I backslid a little bit. I'm not sharing that love like I used to. Just by a show of hands. Amen. Amen. Hey, don't be afraid. We're all there. We've all done it. Amen. You say, preacher, I need you to pray for me. Amen. Hands all over. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's it. That's how it works. Prayer. And then that spirit will just move and change things in your life. Prayer changes everything. Dear Lord God, as we continue with this altar call, Lord, we just pray you bless your people. Lord, you touch your people. God, that you continue to move on our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, altar's open.